covenant this morning. Um, you, you know, I, um, I think sometimes we, and I do know this, sometimes we separate the old too much from the new. But the Lord said, I, I, I'm the Lord and I change not. And, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, the Levitical laws and uh, uh, feast days, holy days, new moon days, Sabbath days, you know, especially for what we call the Gentile believers. But I, I, I will say this. There's so many promises in this book. I mean, promises. How, how many of you ever have given somebody a promise? Let me see your hands. Now, let me. And how many of you have kept those promises? <laughs> how many of you ever have broken a promise? <laughs> But you know what? It's impossible for God to break his promise. So in, in the old days, a, a, a man's word was his surety. If somebody said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to be. And we understand natural things happen. But God is not a man. Hallelujah. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it, will he not do it? Has he spoken it, shall he not make it good? And so we see the revelation of the Father through Jesus Christ. If you really want to understand the Father, you've got to really study Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus was the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And, and, and so I'm, 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 I, I'm so glad that I, dis, I discovered who Jesus was back in 1975. But I didn't realize it was a progressive revelation. Say progressive revelation. Uh, when you come into this world in the physical form as a baby, you are a human being. Hello? You are a human being. But it is, it is a progressive growth, isn't it? You've come a long way, baby. You, you started out as a one cell uh, creation, and now you're over 32 trillion cells. Did you know that? Man, that, that, you've come a long way. Started out one cell, now you're 32 trillion cells. But it's not just the growth of your physical body, but it was the growth of your knowledge, of your intelligence, of understanding. And the, from, from the moment you were given birth to, your parents began to teach you, train you, educate you. I, I mean, can you imagine? They had to teach you how to uh, 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 talk and how to walk and, and, and even how to think and how to feed yourself and how to clothe yourself. How many still remember trying to learn how to tie your shoes? I remember that as a little kid. I still remember trying to fuss with my, 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 my shoe strings. Of course, I don't wear them kind of shoes anymore praise the lord <laughs> but but it took it took some time for me to learn and then you had to go through preschool and kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade and fourth grade now the wonderful advantage uh, uh, of being born into this world at that moment is you didn't have to unlearn anything you, there is nothing in your head <laughs> You say, well, that's terrible. I was born with nothing in your head. No, your head was ready to receive a, a, a download of information, which brought transformation, did, did it not? And, and so you began to be educated. Well, uh, you know, Nicodemus came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus, he didn't understand. He said, you mean I got to go back into my mama's womb and come forth again? He, he said, no. He said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So when you got born again, all of a sudden, and the Bible says that if you raise up a child in the way they, sh they should go, when they are old, they're not the part thereof. Uh, now, now, I, I think we, we just assume that if you're, if you're born in a Christian family, you're always going to fly right and do right. That, that's not what it says at all. See, if, 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 if you're raised in a home where the father and the mother, say father and a mother, have gone through this wonderful transformation of the renewing of their mind. For in other words, they, they're, they're, now they see it the way that God sees it. They do it the way that God does it. They speak it the way that God speaks it. 
They, 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 they uh, desire it the way that God desires it. And you bring your children up underneath that, uh, that, that, that influence, that divine persuasion. It makes it so much easier for them to assimilate all that God has for them. I, I want you to know that uh, they figure there's at least 7,000 promises in the Bible. And we know that through these exceedingly great and precious promises, according to Apostle Peter, we become partakers of the divine nature. And Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, that they may be one even as we are one. And we know that Jesus lived in a realm where all things was possible. Now, when I say all things are possible, I'm talking about according to what the will of the Father is for you at that moment, in that season, at that time, in that place you're at. For instance, Jesus knew he was called to preach. I don't know when he got that revelation, but he didn't go out and begin to preach until he was water baptized. And then he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He went into the wilderness. After 40 days, he overcame the temptations. He came out in the power of the Holy Ghost. And the very first sermon he ever preached was discovered in Luke 4.18, where he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus went out in the power of the Spirit, and he began to what? Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, open the eyes of the blind, uh, 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 open the ears of the deaf, uh, loose the tongue of the dumb, and cleanse the lepers. He, he began to do amazing things. And in the midst of his ministry, he said this to his disciples he said the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these shall you do now now here's the reality though for me to walk in that realm where Jesus walked I have to also walk in his nature his character his personality his thoughts his emotions his desires and his purpose you got to take the whole package you know, when you go in and buy a car, a modern day car, most cars, when I was a kid, cars, you, you had to order special things in order to get uh, wind, electric windows. They were all rolled up. Remember all the, uh, the all of you old enough, remember when you buy, buy the car, you had to roll it up. Man, that took a lot of work, didn't it? <laughs> you had to roll up your windows. You know, you don't go in there and buy a new modern car sitting on a lot, let's say it's, if it's a brand new luxury car, and you say, well, you know what, I'm not going to take the electric windows. And I'm not going to take the air conditioning, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to take, you know, the spare tire. No, no, they say you get the whole package. Now listen, whether you know it or not, you get the whole package. When you got born again, it's there. It's available for you. But there's three things that absolutely must be evident in our life that we've got to really, and you've got to really desire these things. And of course, in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now abide with faith, hope, and love. These elements are so important because without faith, it is impossible to please him. And if I have not love, I'm like sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if you lose your hope, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. That hope is the dream, the purpose, the plan, the mission, the blueprint. Amen. And you can, and you, and, and if you don't have a purpose for living, at 12 years old, Jesus had a divine hope. He had a divine purpose. He said, I must be about my father's business. Now, you know what? If you have not made uh, living for God your, your supreme purpose, then you, you are just out here and, and, and you're like, you're like a, 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 a piece of driftwood upon the ocean. You're just being tossed to and fro. You, you, got, you got to have a vision where there is no vision of people perish. And what should be my vision, Pastor Mike? Well, uh, you know, people say to me, Pastor Mike, I, I, I don't know if God's called me to be an apostle, a prophet, or a bassist, or a pastor, or a teacher, or maybe I'm not a part of the fivefold ministry gifts. Listen, that's not your purpose. The time will come when God will give you a revelation if you're called to walk in those areas. Now, if you're not called to be an apostle, I don't care how much you try to be an apostle, you ain't going to be an apostle. Hello? Just like if God didn't make you a woman, brother, you're never going to be a woman. 
I'm sorry, I don't care what they say, you'll never be a... And brother, if you, if, sister, if you're a born a woman, you're never going to be a man. Hello? You understand what I'm saying? But see, it seems like people have lost their, 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 their reason. They've lost their mind because sin has come in and has darkened their heart. And God says, I have turned them over to a reprobate mind. That's what you call a reprobate mind. But I want you to know that there's no promise, no blessing, no provision that God has given to us that is not available for you. Wow, doesn't that get you excited? Man, I, I know you're sitting in shock. Otherwise, you'd be shouting right now. I know you'd be shouting. Because there is not a promise. Matter of fact, I did a whole series of books back there called God Still Gives Dreams and Visions. God Still Gives Prophecy. God Still Heals. God Still Provides. God Still Protects. And, and I think there's like 14 in that series because the body of Christ needs to realize Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I have to apprehend. I have to believe. So let's take a look here. And, and because I, I, I want to talk about some uh, issues this morning. And, and you ever wonder why does anybody here ever struggle to get where God really wants you? Now listen, every hand would be, if I could get both hands up and go get both feet up in the air, I'd do it right now. We all struggle. We all wrestle. And matter of fact, Paul said I, that the fight, the good fight of faith, it is a fight of faith. And it is a fight of agape love. And it is a fight to maintain your vision. When everything says it can't be, it'll never happen. God will never do it for you. First of all, God's not a respecter of people. If God hears your prayers, he'll hear my prayers. No, now I got to be in the right position, you understand. I'm not talking about works here. But, but you know, uh, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now that was written to the body of Christ. So we just got to locate. Now if you're, on the, if you're on the wrong side of the fence, just how did you get there? Well, if you were at one time, you were really loving God, serving God, obeying God, following God. You were on fire for God. Uh, but the day came when you straddled that fence. And that's what the Bible calls being lukewarm. Got one foot in the world and you got one foot in heaven. And, and, and you're like this, you're just, because how many know, especially for men, this is an uncomfortable position on a fence. Hello, y'all growing up, right? That's an uncomfortable position. I don't know if you've ever gotten there, men or women. But listen, so you, you and, and then all of a sudden one day you climbed over and you got over here. Now you got over that fence, you can get back over it. Uh, Brother Brian, I almost called you a pastor. I don't know if that's prophetic. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> when Brian came to me and said, Pastor Mike, you need to tell the people that they, they need to basically repent. And repent means to run towards the light, to run towards Jesus, and they'll get free. I totally agree with that. It, it means that you run towards God. You embrace God. You look to God. He's your, he, he's your strength, your hope, your righteousness, your peace, your joy, your healer, your provider. He's your all in all. He's everything you need. See, we've already got the answer. It is a person, but it must be acquired by faith, hope, and love. Say faith, hope, and love. And the enemy's going to come. We know in the last days it says the love of many, and that's the Greek word agape. The love of many is going to wax cold because iniquity will abound. Whoever thought that a little hand contraption could become a black hole and suck all the brains out of you? What do you mean, suck all the brains out of you? Now, I don't watch zombie movies, okay? But I've seen some, I've seen some advertisement, and, and you got zombies, and they're all like, you know, they ain't, I ain't nothing in their face. My wife and I, a couple years ago, went down here to the local strip mall in Wisconsin. We call them strip malls. I don't know what they're called. But we went down to this little shopping place, and there must have been a dozen kids there. And as we pulled up on our motorcycle, you know, and we looked at these kids, and they were all like in another world. Guess where they were? All of those kids' faces were right here. That's right where they're at. And their minds were being filled with stuff I don't even want to imagine. And as a man thinketh, so is he. So when you get born again, when you're in the natural, you're a human being. But you begin to develop your mind, 
your attitude, your emotions. Don't tell me what you watch doesn't affect you. You know, garbage in, garbage out. I don't know if you know this, but computers have what they call an operating system. Most computers today have what we call Windows 10. Uh, God deliver us. And then there's another operating system called Linux. Now, uh, in one, I don't know if you know this, but a computer can operate in two different operating systems. Not at once. You got to switch. You can switch between the Linux and you can switch between the Windows. Now, some people like Linux because it's more of an open free market and you can do all kinds of programming in it. OK, well, when you get born again, it's like you were in the Windows mode and God wants you to wipe out that old programming and he wants you to get the Linux mode. Now, I'm not pushing Linux. I'm just saying that God wants you to be operating in one operating system. And that's called the will and the word and the nature and the character of God. And if you're operating in the Linux and the Windows, you will be, you will be depressed, tormented. Uh, you'll get upset. You'll get angry. Lust will overwhelm you. Fear will overwhelm you. You know, as a pastor, I can only take you where I live. And that's what's really frightening to me right now with the body of Christ in America. That so many pastors got into fear. Now, I told you from the very beginning when this thing hit, let those who, who are brave of heart, you all come, we're not shutting down none of our meetings. You that are fearful, it's okay, we'll pray for you. But as a pastor, as a pastor, yeah, but aren't we supposed to obey the laws of the land, Romans chapter 13. Do you know who wrote Romans 13? How many know who wrote Romans 13? Let me see your hands. Anybody know that? Well, who wrote Romans 13? Paul. Paul. Did Paul break the laws of the land? Yes, he did. He broke the laws of the land. <laughs> Paul, who he was not a hypocrite. You got to rightly discern what he was talking about. When laws are passed that agree with the word of God, you do what God says and not what man says. Say, praise the Lord. I, I preached myself happy this morning. Now, people can only live where they're at. So if you're, if, if you're, you come to church and you're operating in Linux, praise the Lord, hallelujah, God, you're so good. And then you walk out the door and do you pop over into the windows mode? Do you pop over into the flesh? Do you, it's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes, but in order for me to apprehend all the promises, have you apprehended all of the promises, Pastor Mike? Oh, are you kidding? But uh, but it's still available for me. Say, praise God, there's hope for Pastor Mike. Yeah. Amen. There's still hope for us. So look down here in verse 31. And I want you to, we're going to zero in on this for a little while this morning. And then tonight I want to talk about, listen, I want to talk about how David, I'm talking about David who was, huh? I, I'm in Isaiah chapter 40. I, where you all at? Yeah, I, I thought you all had the mind of Christ. No, <laughs> I'm teasing. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. But. But tonight I want to talk about David. And did you ever recognize Hebrews 11 as a faith hall of fame? Yeah. I mean, 50 major events of men and women that took a hold of God in the old covenant. Now, if they could take a hold of God in the old. Can't I take a hold of him in the new? Yeah. I said, can't I take a hold? Can't you take a hold of God in the new? Yeah. Why, why let the world, the flesh, and the devil limit you? Why let your former education stop you from being all that God wants you to be? That's really what I talk about tonight. I, I want to talk. Hey, Pastor Mike, have you missed it in the past? Have you fallen short? Have, 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 you, have you not apprehended everything? Yes, that's true. But you know what? I'm not letting it stop my future. I'm not letting where I miss God in the past, maybe even yesterday, I'm not letting it stop me. And actually, when the enemy has come and somehow he found a way in my life or my family's life or my loved one's lives, you know what I do? I, I, I don't get discouraged and give up. I just said, I'm going to make you double regret you ever did that. 
I'm going to make you wish the day came that you never did that. Did you know when John the Baptist had his head cut off? You know what it said Jesus did? And Jesus rose up and went to preach. You know how you get back at the devil? Preach the gospel. Walk the gospel. Speak the gospel. Think the gospel. Do the gospel. Go after God. Go after God. And as long as there's breath in your lungs, there's still great hope for you. So look there in verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord. In chapter 40 of Isaiah. But they that wait upon the Lord. Who? They that wait. And this is verse 31. Y'all wake up now. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I don't know if you know this, in the old days, in the old style churches, they'd have two men standing in the back and they had real long poles. And on the end of the poles, they had like a, like a, a, a cloth ball that was solid. And when someone began to fall asleep, this is what these guys would do. They'd walk up behind you and pop you in the head. <laughs> did you know they did that kind of stuff? Those people were so deep in the spirit that none of them got offended. If you did that today, the whole congregation would walk out, wouldn't they? <laughs> that's, how, that's how onion skinned we become. I actually had a woman one time, and we had, at one time, we had a lot of people coming and going. And there was a lady that disappeared, and I, I began to investigate. And, and in those days, I, I would try to run to the front door. I don't do that no more, because we're going to pray for people and believe with people. And I'd shake people's door hands as they went out the door. And it turned out one Sunday, I didn't get back there in time. And she walked out the door without Pastor Mike shaking her hand. And she got so highly offended, she never came back. You know what her problem was? She needed to get her mind renewed. It's not Pastor Mike's touch. It's the touch of Jesus that matters. Amen. And so here we are. They that wait upon the Lord. What's going to happen to them? They shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord. And we're going to talk about the word wait in just a little bit. But I want to show you something here. They that wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. You know, it says uh, that you better by faith and patience apprehend the promises, lest you become wearied and you faint in your minds. Hebrews 10. We better not faint. Many, many people are fainting today. They're giving up today. They're falling by the wayside today. They're becoming weary. You know why? Because we're not wrestling flesh and blood. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. You got to be, I've got a book back there called The Weapons of Our Spiritual Warfare. And all it really is is basically scriptures. Because a lot of your spiritual warfare books, I've picked them up and they just go on and on and on and on, but they don't give you the weapons. So in that book, you got the weapons to deal with the devil. And it says, above all, say above all. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench half the fiery darts. No, all the fiery darts of the wicked one. All the fire. So when the enemy comes, you can take the shield of faith. What? Your trust, your confidence, your dependence, your reliance upon God. Actually, in the Hebrew, the word wait in this particular set of scriptures, what it refers to is trusting, hoping, and expecting. A look, a looking to God. Said to Brother Brian that there's a divine looking to Jesus. They that wait. Those who are waiting are those who are looking to God with expectation. They're looking to God. See, I, I, I'm not seeking an experience, but I'm expecting an experience. I'm not seeking a visitation from God. I'm expecting a visitation from God. I'm not looking for a healing, but I'm expecting it to happen at any moment. I, I told you, and, and, and these are some of the repetitive stories because they're just the stories I like to repeat. Uh, I, I've, I've actually got over 2,000 stories, if you could believe that. 
But uh, when we put this building up and Brother Howard was working with us and you were here when we were putting the steel up and we, we, uh, we only had the crane for one day to get the main beams up back in 1986 and so the rest of it had to be manhandled. And so us guys are up there, we had to take ropes and we had to pull the big steel beams up under purlings and we're walking and when I was doing this, something tore in, a, in my lower abdomen and, and, and I got a hernia. And uh, so I, I didn't aggressively take a hold of God I, I just because I believe by his stripes you were. And if you were, you was. And if you was, you am. And if you am, you is. That's just what I believe. I have a revelation. I have a revelation of that. See, every promise can become a revelation to you. It doesn't mean it's a revelation. You might have a revelation when it comes to finances that I might not have. It, 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 uh, you know, from glory to glory, revelations grow just like a child grows, just like your IQ should grow. Uh, you know, I read something the other day. I couldn't hardly believe it. They say when a man hits 57 years old, that basically his brain stops absorbing and he can no longer learn anything. Oh, I'm so glad that's not true for me. You know, I'm 64 and my brain is still a sponge. I'm still memorizing scriptures. I'm still devouring the word. I'm still learning things every day of my life. And I knew some mighty men of faith. I was ordained through Lester Summerall. And until the day he died in his 80s, his brain was as sharp as a whistle. Sharp as a razor blade. Kenneth Hagin in his 80s. Sharp. Mama Jenkins, who was a friend of mine. She was 102 years old when she, matter of fact, let me tell you a little story. I was preaching at another meeting. And she was there and she was just a visitor and she's sitting on the very front row and I'm preaching under the Holy Ghost. I began to move in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, began to prophesy and I walked up to her and a prophetic word came out of my mouth for her. Now, I don't know what I said because a lot of times I'm so deep in the spirit. I have no idea. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm at. I'm telling you, there's times I am so drunk. How many have ever been drunk in the natural and you woke up the next morning, you don't even know how you got there. There's sometimes in the spirit I get so lost that I don't remember what I said. People would say to me, oh, Pastor Mike, you said thus and thus and thus. I said, did I really? I'm sorry. I have a good excuse. I was drunk. I was drunk. I don't believe in being drunk in the Holy Ghost. And you don't believe the book of Acts chapter 2 or the book of Joel. So anyways, I prophesied over Mama, and then I went back to preaching. Now, she was the spiritual granddaughter of Smith Wigglesworth. Her parents... We're African Americans, and they were in upper years. And brother and brother Smith walked up to them and prophesied over them, and told them they were going to have a child. I think they were almost in their sixties. They looked at each other and said, "There ain't no way. There ain't." Here we go, Pastor Pete and Sherry. <laughs> so and they said, "No way, no way, no way." And and you know what? Yeah, sure enough, she got pregnant, and they gave birth to a, li- a a beautiful little girl, and and that was Mama Jenkins, Mary Jenkins. So I prophesied over her, and I went back to preaching. And then after the service, she's sitting over here. Now, when you're 102 years old, you can command people around. And mama, she told you what to do. You didn't tell her what to do. And mama went like this to me. And I went over there. I said, yes, mama. I got down on my knees. She said, let me tell you something, son. I said, okay, mama. I thought she was going to rebuke me. She said, in all of these years... She said only two men. Well, she said really only three men have prophesied over me and what they said was from heaven. He, she said the rest of them be, who began to prophesy, they actually had to stop. They couldn't even complete it. She said only three men have ever given me an accurate prophetic word. I said, okay, mama, I thought she was going to rebuke me. And she says, you're the third one. Give Jesus a hand clap. That ain't Mike Yeager, because if I would have known that ahead of time, I probably would have got in the flesh and not prophesied. (laughs) But I tell you, there is this place in the spirit where your mind can be renewed, your life can be transformed. When the world says it's all over with, it's just beginning. I I heard the Lord say right now, there's some of you, the doctor has said it's all over with, but I want you to know it's not over until God says it's over. I want you to know that God is more than enough. Now, the problem is not God. It's the problem is us people, yes, especially us leaders. Yes. I mean, we're, 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 not, we're not apprehending by faith, by love, and by hope the promises. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. 
I, I tell you, you know, there, there is what we call a physical anointing. I'm going to write a book about it someday, that there is a physical empowerment and enablement. It came upon Elijah, and he outran the horses and chariots. I, I, I would go to the Philippines, and uh, I would always find the, the, I would find the cheapest ticket I could trying to be conservative and, and not wasteful. And so I, I, I'd go, I'd fly in the Philippine Airlines. And those chairs were made for Filipinos. Now I'm a little guy, but they're smaller than I am. And, I, and you get on that plane and you're scrunched already. Now they got that. Now thank God, it, it's not like when you get to the Philippines and you get onto what we call a, 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 a well, it, it's like a big Jeep. And they pack it with pigs and chicken and people. And the diesel pipes come up and they didn't design it right. And there's no windows. So when you're going down the road, all that diesel fume comes in and you're breathing it in. So I'd, got, I'd get into the Philippine airplane and I'd crunched up and I'd start to pray. And that was a 24-hour flight. And we'd have to stop off maybe in, 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 in China somewhere or in Japan. And then we'd go on to the rest of the way to Manila. And I'm telling you what, by the time we got there, that, that plane stunk so bad from baby poop, you can't believe it. I mean, terrible smell. You could hardly breathe. And I'd almost have to breathe through my shirt. And I got jet lag and the kid's been crying and you can't go to sleep. How many have ever been on a plane trip like that? You can't sleep. There ain't no way you can sleep. You're all crunched up and the kids are screaming and crying. And the place smells so bad. That's just how it was. And so I'd get there, I'd get to Manila, and then I'd have to catch a double prop airplane. And I'd go way over into the province of Samar. I'd land in Samar, and now I'd get into a jeepney. And I'd have to ride that jeepney for 5 to 6 to 7 to 10 to 12 hours. Rough roads. Uh, they'd be stopping and starting. The diesel fuel coming in. My head would be busting. I'd feel like I'm going to black out at any moment. I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost. And we finally get to the village I'm going to first preach in. I'd get off. I'd get my way to the church, get directions. They're already, already singing and worshiping. I'd come in sit down. They said, well, the American is here. They had pack it out because I went places where white people didn't go anymore since World War II. And all of a sudden, they turned the pulpit over to me. The power of God would hit me, and I would go for 20 days hitting church after church under the power of the Holy Ghost. Give the Lord a hand clap. But see, I didn't give in to my flesh. I agreed with God. So here is what God wants. Say, this is what God wants. Let's read this again, and then we're going to back up to verse 21. I want to show you something here. But they that wait upon the Lord, say they that wait. Say he's talking about me. It's talking about trusting, depending, relying, looking, expecting. You got your eyes on Jesus now. You're not going to have your eyes on the problem. You don't deny the problem, but you deny the right for it to exist. So I'll come back to that story. I got a hernia. Y'all thought I forgot. I did. <laughs> I got a hernia. Well, I kind of went after it kind of like just real, you know, lukewarm, you know, like, because I believe in healing. I, I, I'd lay my hands on it and say, in Jesus' name, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Well, a couple years went by. I thought it was three. Kathy said it was two. It got so bad now to where my stomach lining's totally tore out, and that thing is hanging, and it's beginning to twist on me, and it can get strangled. How many know that's very dangerous? I didn't have a spirit of fear, though. I didn't have no fear because God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind. And so what I did, I said, okay, now it's time to get serious with this thing. And I got a hold of the word, and I said, now, Lord, your word says. Now, I wouldn't tell somebody to do this. They got to know in their heart what to do. And it came into my heart what I was supposed to do. And I take my fingers, and I grab that hanging sack, and I shove it up back in. I'd say, in Jesus' name. And I'd do it again. I do, I don't know how many times through the day I'd do that. Just shove it. I'd shove it. I'd shove it. So if you see me walking around, that's what I look like, you know. It looked like I'd just come out of Baltimore. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, man, that's the way it was, man. I'm shoving it, man. So this went on for a day, two days, three days, four days, five days. I'm shoving it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Pastor, how long would you have kept doing that? I, 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 as far as I was concerned, I was never going to stop. In G I'm healed. I'm healed. It went on for two weeks. 
listen, two weeks, shoving it, shoving it, shoving it. I'm talking about radical here now. I'm, I'm, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't call anybody and say, oh, pray for me, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, I just kept shoving it. And I went to bed one night. And my wife can testify. I went to bed one night, got up the next morning, and it was gone, and it's never come back. And that's been over 30 years ago. Give the Lord a hand clap. Why would you do that, Pastor Mike? Because I, I got a hold of the promise. I got a hold of the blessing. I didn't think it. I didn't just hope it. I didn't maybe saw it. I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew. That's faith. You can't fake it. You can fake faith for a while. But if you're not, now you can begin in faith, because in James, it says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But uh, you, you, like faith and patience, you got to have patience. And, and you got to endure to the end. So look down there. Now you understand, the Israelites, this promise is given to the Jewish descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, not Jews, but the, the seed of Israel. And you know what? These people have gotten out of the will of God. You ever notice how many times the Israelites got out of the will of God and got in trouble? Have you ever noticed how many times you got out of the will of God and got in trouble? But God's always merciful. His mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad? Grab his mercy. Grab his mercy. Grab his mercy. <laughs> Have you not known? Listen to what he says. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? So what he's going to do now is he's going to try to bring him to this place where they're going to wait upon the Lord. They're going to renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings of eagles and they're going to run and not be weary. I prophesy that over the bride of Christ in these last days. I prophesy the body of Christ is in the same condition it was in this particular chapter. And, but yet the prophet gave to them what they needed. I'm giving you what you need. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the truth. And you need to renew your mind. You need to see how God sees it. Speak it the way that God. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro upon the face of the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect towards him. That means they're in agreement with him. God is looking. He's looking. He's saying, are you in agreement with me, Lester? Are you in agreement with me, Sherry? Are you in agreement with me, Vaughn? Are you in agreement with me? See, that's what he's looking for, Dennis. Are you in agreement with me? And all he's waiting, and to the de degree that you agree with God, now listen, not in a spasmatic form. I agree with you, God. Oh, no. Uh, Lord, I know you say, yeah, but... And, 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 and we're going to talk about that a little bit here. And we're, but, but I want you to know that God wants you to bring to, you to a place to where you know him. You just don't know about him. You just don't know. You know him. See, I know Jesus as my healer. When, when I had that terrible snowmobile accident and I literally fell off of a snowmobile going down the highway for the township in a terrible storm and I hit black ice and my knee hit that asphalt and this was back probably in 19, uh, uh, probably about 1992 and when I, my knee hit that asphalt, it, it smashed my kneecap and ripped my kneecap off. Now when I say ripped my kneecap off, I don't mean it fell off of my leg. It's there, but I could grab my kneecap and I could move it all over the place. It was too dark out. I couldn't see if it was rain. It, I couldn't see if it was bleeding. And so what did I do? I repented. My snowmobile went spinning. I went flying, slammed my knee. Now I had a job to get done. I had to pick up a big construction worker all the way over there in Fairfield almost to bring him back to get to a big plow where he could plow the roads. And it was raining and snowing, freezing. It was terrible. And when I did that, what did you do, Pastor Mike? I repented for being stupid. I was going too fast. Say repent for being stupid. But God will still help you. I mean, know that. And then I spoke to that kneecap. I said, I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. Did it change at all, Pastor Mike? Not at all. No change in it. What did you do? I stuck. Anybody with a natural brain would have gone back home. 
But, and we didn't have cell phones in those days. And I stuck my leg out stiff in front of me, going through the snow. And I went all the way over there, rough. It was bad. Too long of a story. I could take an hour to tell it. Picked the guy up, big guy. And now I didn't tell him, oh, I've messed up my kneecap. I didn't tell anybody. Not because I was afraid to, but I knew that I knew that I knew by his stripes I was healed. And so then I brought the guy and I dropped him off and I had to take another way because the roads were flooded. I finally got back that Sunday. We couldn't have service because the snow was so bad. The next Sunday I come in like hop along Cassidy. I'm like this. I'm just speaking healing. I'm preaching. You know what? There's only been two times I think I didn't preach in the last 37 years because I got sick. And really in both of those cases, the truth of the matter is I was just lazy. <laughs> I could have preached, but I was lazy. So anyways, that Sunday, I, I get up there, and, and, and Helen Rhodes, who was a, a nurse, she comes up to me, and she said, Pastor Mike, what's going on with your leg? And, and, and I told her what happened. She said, oh, Brother Mike, she said, I damaged my kneecap like that, but not near as bad. She said, I went and have operations. She says, my knee's never been the same. I didn't argue with her. I didn't say, well, I'm believing God. See, I'm not proving, I'm not trying to prove to you I've got faith. This is between me and Jesus. Hey, it's between me and Jesus. Whatever you're believing God for, it's between you and Jesus. And so what did you do, Pastor Mike? I kept speaking to my leg. I kept speaking to my kneecap. Yeah, I'm healed. I'm healed, devil. You're a liar. Ha, ha, ha. Tears rolling down my face. And I'm telling you, I don't know what happened. But in a couple weeks' time, that knee was completely normal. And praise the Lord, it's been normal ever since. Praise the Lord. But notice what happened to the people. Now, what are you going through this for, Pastor Mike? Look at the early church. Now look at the modern day church. Something is wrong. And it isn't with God. It's with the body of Christ. But I believe the body of Christ is going to wake up to the reality of who God is. So God is telling them, hey, do, do you guys forget who I am. Don't you remember Egypt? Don't you remember Joseph? Don't you remember Abraham? Don't you remember David? Don't you remember Gideon? Don't Guys, where have you been? Don't you remember who I am? Somehow the devil robbed you from who I am. Remember the thief comes to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. He comes to steal the revelation of who God is. He comes to kill and he comes to destroy us. Now I, I put up on Facebook here probably about two months ago. I said if Pastor Mike dies from some, some kind of terrible disease as I'm trusting God. I said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I'm with Jesus. That's not the issue. I'm still with Jesus. It has nothing to do with my salvation. But I'll tell you what I want to stick around and spit in the devil's face. I, really, I just wrote, my newest book is called, it's called Spitting in the Devil's Face. It's in the back. Spitting in the devil. I love to spit in the devil's face. When I got the revelation of divine healing as a 19-year-old kid, I got it because I've been in hospitals many times for my lungs, had a speech impediment, hearing problems. I told, I, when I got hold of that, the revelation that by his stripes I'm healed, I told the devil, I said, devil, in the name of Jesus, I said, I'm going to spit in your face. And I said, you do whatever you want to me because I'm not looking to you. I'm looking to God and God is greater than you. I mean, I really did. You say, how dare you threaten the devil? I even told the devil. I said, I'm not opening the door. I just said, I said, I don't care what you hit with me with. I don't care if you hit me with cancer. I said, I'm trusting God. Three times he hit me with cancer. One time with tumors. Another time with prostate cancer. And another time with colon cancer. The, and I never went to the medical world. I went to great physician. And that, that, was, my, that, was, that was a three-month battle. Because I'm telling you what, when I sat down in that toilet, everything that was inside of me was coming out. Out, and it wasn't nice looking either. It was so terrible. It was so ugly. I had to stop looking in the toilet. That's how bad it was. And I didn't tell, didn't even tell my family. I just walked this floor and I'd say, I'll live and not die. I'll live and not die. I'll live and not die. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. God can't lie. And you know, after three months, praise God, I went to bed one night, got up the next morning and was gone and it's never come back. And that was back in 19, uh, in 2003, I think. So, he says, don't you know who I am? 
Look here in verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. That bringeth the princesses to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high. Do what? Get your eyes up. The Bible says, uh, uh, it, it says that if you be risen with him, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, for, you're, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall appear with him in glory. He's our life. That was the message of the early church. Jesus is my life. He's my all in all. He's my everything. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Abide in me and my word abides in you. And you can ask what you will. The promises and it should be done unto you. Grab that. Grab that. Grab that. Grab that promise. Grab. I don't know what you're going through. Now listen, you can't eat this all in one night. How do you eat an elephant? How do you eat one bite at a time? You can't eat an elephant all at one time. You got to eat it. And this is bigger than an elephant. <laughs> this is divine revelation from heaven. Well, look, it says here, lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number that calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power. Not one faileth. Did you know they say there's as many stars in the heaven as there stands on the seashore. Trillions and trillions of galaxies out there. Trillions. Not just solar systems, galaxies. Listen to this. And he gave a name to every single star. And he knows them all by name. God knows every star. Did you know the Bible says that God knows every speck of dust? Did you know that God says he knows every hair on your head? Why are we struggling to trust him? I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because when man committed sin, demonic powers came. And these demonic powers are influencing. Listen, unless you're in the spirit, unless your mind is renewed, unless you're under the control of God, these demonic powers are, uh, are, are attacking your thoughts, your desires, your emotions, your attitude, your word, your, your actions, uh, uh, your nature, your character, your personality, and your will. And I'm not double conscious. I just know. That Jesus said this, he said to the people who are listening to a sermon, he said, I'm from above and you're from beneath. Demonic powers are the only powers that are trying to influence to contradict what God's word says. Demonic powers are telling you as a born again, Holy Ghost man and woman, you're not healed. Demonic powers are telling you you're all alone and nobody loves you. Demonic powers are tormenting you. These are demonic powers. They're everywhere. The air is filled. Now the angels of the Lord are here. And the word of God's going forth. And, and, and he sent his word and he healed. But there are demonic. Listen, Hollywood is under the influence of demonic powers. The news media, I'm telling the whole news media. Well, how do you know they're under demonic? He says, wickedness will cover the earth, gross darkness. Anything that contradicts what God's word says is the activity of demonic powers. Yes. Peter said, you are the Christ. And then Peter said, oh, you don't have to die for us. And, P and Jesus said, yeah, yeah, get behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that are of God, but the things of man. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm just going to be blunt. Well, I'll never come back. That's fine. You can join the other thousands and thousands and thousands in the 37 years that God offended and left. It's not because I don't love you, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm telling you right now, I'm not saying there's not Christians in a medical world. But if that Christian doctor isn't laying hands on you, speaking the word over you, declaring what Jesus has done for you, and he's just going on and on about the symptoms and how dangerous it is and how terrible it is, he, it is not 
It is not just a man talking to you. It is the devil talking to you. That's the devil telling you that as a born again, spirit filled man and woman, oh, this thing is going to kill you. See, why in the world would I agree with the devil? I didn't say they're the devil. I said demonic powers are at work. I'll give you an example. David, I'll talk about it tonight. David, he comes along and there's the Philistine giant come out. Everybody runs for 40 days. David stands up and says, well, because he's seeing it how God sees. He don't see a giant. He sees a man that does not have a covenant with God who is an enemy of God. And what does he say to that giant? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His brother comes along, his older brother, Eliab, and he says, I know your naughty heart. How many of you know that was not God talking through Eliab? That was the devil talking through Eliab. That's the devil talking through Ilya. Now, he, he, I don't rebuke everybody that says negative stuff to me contrary to the Bible. You know what I do? I just keep my mouth shut and I pray for them. I don't attack them. They're, they're, they're showing where they're at. They're in the flesh. Say, in the flesh. There's a big difference when I'm in the spirit and I'm in the flesh. Let me, I, I'm just, it, just, it is what it is. Everybody who stopped coming to the house of God, and first of all, the pastors are the guiltiest, they were in the flesh. They're in the flesh. Would Jesus have stopped gathering? They're in the flesh. And they'll get fighting mad like the ten spies when Caleb and Joshua, who were in the spirit, and said, listen, those giants in the land of Canaan, there ain't no big deal. Let's go in and take the land. And, and, and you know what those ten spies did? And the people that listened to those spies... They, they, for, they're weeping and crying and wailing. And, and the next thing they do, they take up stones and they're going to kill Caleb and Joshua because they're in the spirit. How, how many of you ever experienced when you were in the spirit? Now, I'm not talking about a religious ignorance and a religious boldness. I'm talking about a divine boldness that brings results. I'm telling you, if you're in the spirit, you're going to see results. It's not just a bunch of hot air. I have people who come to me and they talk real big talk and I just don't see the evidence of it. I like to tell people, I want to see, I want to see your testimony. I want to hear your testimonies. Because your testimonies gives you the reality of where you're at. Oh, Pastor Mike, what if I'm not where I need to be? Okay, that's understandable. Because Paul said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended. But he, he said, I press toward the mark. Okay, so it, 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 here I am, 64 years old. I'm supposed to maybe be in, 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 in college and I'm th in third grade. What am I going to do? Well, I'm not going to say, well, I guess I'll always live my life in third grade. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to study and study till I get into fourth grade. And when I get into fourth grade, I'm going to aim for eighth. Now, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm headed for a, 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 a doctorate degree. And I got a long way to go, but until the day I die, I'm going to keep growing in faith, growing in knowledge, growing in grace, growing in wisdom. Listen, growing in the divine nature. I want to grow in the character of God. Can you say amen? amen. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. So what did David do with his brother? All he said is, there, is there not a cause? Tell the person to you next to you, is there not a cause? And turn your head away from them. I'm not trying to offend you. You will never win an argument with a carnally minded Christian. Amen. You'll never win an argument. Even if you use scripture, unless they're teachable, they're meek. And I'm not putting people down because like I said, I've got a book back there called I Need God Because I'm Stupid. And it's got 83 incredible dumb things I've done basically since I've been saved. Dumb things, dumb things. And that was just for you to know that Pastor Mike has gone through a lot of struggles. And I've had a lot and I could write five more books like that. <laughs> I've done a lot of dumb stuff. You know what I do? I get back up. When I fall down, when I miss the mark, when I get in the flesh, I wish I could tell you that my kids, they walk softly around me because I'm so deep in the spiritual maturity of God. But you know what? They're having to rebuke me through the day because I get in the flesh. 
What are you going to do? I've got to crucify my flesh. The more I crucify the flesh. And so what did David do? He said, is there not a cause? He goes to King Saul. He said, don't let no man but his heart's fear. He said, I'll take care of this rascal. And did he take care of him? He did it in the spirit, didn't he? Listen, I don't know what you're going through right now. But I'll tell you what, the only way you're going to really get the victory, I just heard, I hear the stories over and over just about a, a precious man of God who had gotten cancer. And he went through all kinds of operations and he got all kinds of, uh, got the chemo. He went through that whole process, right? And then he finally got victory over it. Uh, you know, in spite of the, I say, in spite of the medical world, he got victory over it. And then here it has been four or five years. And guess what? It just came back now worse than ever. Why? Because it's a demonic power. It's a demonic spirit. Now, I'm not saying you can eat anything you want and live any way you want. But I'm telling you, there are demonic powers. It says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Baby doll, will you come up, please? All that were oppressed of the devil. Sickness and disease, depression and torment and fear, addictions. It's all demonic people. Now, the devil can't make you do it. But let me ask you something. You can't help but do it if you don't have the right weapons. You need the shield of faith. You need the love of God. You need hope. You need the word. And you can overcome. I'm telling you, from a man who's had overcome uh, 45 years of amazing battles. I mean, you can't believe how many times this church looked like it was going to close down. I mean, no money coming in, but you've never heard me beg for a penny. You've never seen me. You know, I, I'm not being critical, but somebody told me about one brother, and I really always loved the brother, and, 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 but he went through a terrible uh, situation with cancer. This brother did, well-known TV preacher, and uh, they said, oh, he, he, and he went through the chemo and the radiation. I'm not picking on him. That's where he was at, and in spite of it, he made it. Now, listen to this. All. And he said, oh, but he's really come a long way now. He's really going after God now I thought wonderful awesome so I turned him on yesterday his latest video from last Sunday and here and 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 here he is same shenanigans he gets at the end of this message and he says now in the upper room there was 120 people and here's a plaque and we want to put your name on this plaque for a thousand dollars we need a hundred and twenty people to give a thousand dollars how many I'm telling you That's not God. That is not God. You want to believe it's God? That's fine. That's the flesh. You don't need to do those shenanigans. I'm standing over in this area. We are $24,000 behind bills. I'm over here and I'm complaining to God back in about 19, maybe about 1990. I'm talking to God. I said, God, we, and and I said, he interfered with my prayer. I heard the Lord say, son, I mean, just shook me. I hear his voice. I said, yes, Lord. He said, "Uh, your problem is not money. I was shocked. He said, I said, what? He said, your problem is not money. I said, what is it? This is what he said to me. He said, it's faith. He said, you just don't trust me enough. Instead of arguing with him. Now, if somebody, a a man would have said that to me, I'd probably gotten fighting mad. If one of you said, brother, might just believe God. (laughs) You know, but God said it to me. You're not trusting me. And so I repented. I did. So uh, four or five days went by. And the brother who did this is with us this morning. And I went to my office. I didn't even know this brother had any money. Had no idea he had any money. I'm in the office and my bills are all there. This brother walks in real nice and quiet. And he says, Brother Mike, he said, oh, you got any bills that need to be paid in the church? I got them all there. I said, yes. I didn't tell him how much. He said, well, I just want to bless the church. I want to help the church. I'm thinking in my head, maybe 100, 500 bucks, you know. I just want to bless the church. So, and, and actually, it takes way more faith for people to give than for us to receive. How I many you know that? Yeah. He had more faith than I did. <laughs> so I'm behind the desk, and, 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 and I, 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 he pulls out his checkbook, and I tell him the amount. I believe it was $24,000. He's writing out a check. Hands it to me. He says, have a good day or something like that. Turn around and walk. And there was a check for (laughs) $24,000. God is able. Amen. God is able. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I know it's, it's hot in here, ain't it?
It's the Holy Ghost. You can take your jacket <laughs> off, baby. God is good. <laughs> I, I know, I know y'all are going through some difficulties. 